Well, thank you, Dean. Uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to getting into the, the conversation portion of this uh, and the questions from students because I understand a part of this was not to have me talking at you, but to really have a, a bit more of a discussion about some of the issues that are going on and some of the things that would benefit the most from people like all of you uh, pursuing paths in public service. Uh, you would ask first of to, for me to say just a little bit about 9-11 uh, and my own path uh, to public service. And although my career in government started before 9-11, for me and for a lot of people, uh, I'm not sure those are entirely distinct topics. I sometimes look back on my time as a line prosecutor, I used to say baby prosecutor, uh, on the front lines in Atlanta in the 90s working with other lawyers, state and local police, FBI special agents, putting away corrupt public officials and dangerous violent criminals and just about everything in between. And what motivated me then uh, and makes me and made me feel like I had the best job in the whole world uh, was the cases, the, the purity of advancing justice and of fighting for victims uh, and their families. I think, for example, about a case I had about 25 years ago involving a single mom of a seven-year-old little boy. The guy that we were prosecuting had targeted her for a hit to prevent her from testifying. And as if that weren't enough, his plot included hiding her body and parking her car in long-term parking at the airport so that everybody, including her seven-year-old little boy, would think that motherhood had just been too much for her and she'd just abandoned him. And I remember the afternoon in that courtroom in Atlanta when we put the guy away for the rest of his life. And that woman, the mom, uh, who couldn't have been more than about 100 pounds, uh, was sort of shuttling back and forth between each of us on the team, hugging us uh, and sort of shuddering uh, as she was hugging us, and she kept saying the same thing to each one of us over and over again. She kept saying, thank you, thank you for saving my life. Uh, and in that moment, it kind of hit me, you know, light bulb went on, that there's a seven-year-old boy who's going to grow up with his mom instead of being a permanently scarred orphan for the rest of his life. And we, the team, the agents and I, we did that. And now that may have been a result that didn't matter to anybody in the world outside of that courtroom, but it absolutely changed the life of that mom and that little boy uh, in the most really fundamental way possible. And whatever else I do in my career, I will never, ever forget that moment or any number of other moments like that uh, in these kinds of jobs. So then, fast forward, 2001, summer of 2001, my family and I moved to D.C. Uh, and over the next several years, uh, as the dean alluded to, I served in various leadership roles in the Justice Department, including overseeing the Justice Department's criminal division, which at the time included national security programs, especially counterterrorism. And on the morning of September 11th, 2001, I was a fairly new appointee, still getting the lay of the land, when I heard that something was happening up in New York. Uh, now, I'm a born and raised New Yorker, so seeing the first images of smoke pouring out of the World Trade Center was not just shocking, but personal, uh, to say the very least. You know, my mom, for example, uh, worked just a couple of blocks away, and I remember racing across Pennsylvania Avenue from the Justice Department and spending most of the day in a jam-packed command center at FBI headquarters with the Attorney General and then FBI Director Mueller. And everybody there was trying to help while at the same time struggling to comprehend the horrific reality of what was unfolding. And we didn't initially know who was attacking us or, or if more attacks were coming. We all just urgently wanted to do something. I also remember in the months that followed working to understand how 19 terrorists had been inside the United States plotting a complicated, synchronized attack, and yet government agencies, we, hadn't discovered their plans or been able to stop them. So in taking this job 16 years later, 
I sort of vividly remember the urgency that we all felt in that packed FBI command center on 9-11 and the urgency that we all felt for months every time there was a plane that was non-responsive to air traffic control. The urgency that rippled through all of us every time somebody got an envelope with white powder in it and we'd all be thinking, uh-oh, is, is this it? Is it happening again? But more importantly, more importantly, I remembered how that urgency translated into unity and action, uh, into a fierce determination to work tirelessly to prevent something like that from ever happening again. And I decided that I wanted to come back into service to help the Bureau continue on that path. Now, I was sworn in as FBI Director in August of 2017, just before the 16th anniversary of 9-11. And one of the first things I did uh, as director in 2017 was to meet with the 9-11 Memorial and Museum staff up in New York, where I'd been asked to give a speech. And so we talked, uh, and they offered to give uh, me a tour. And so I asked my wife and my, my grown daughter, who had just started a new job in New York, to come with me on the tour. And if any of you haven't had the opportunity to visit that Memorial Museum, I strongly encourage you to find a way to make the trip because it is a deeply moving experience. Outside, there are two sunken fountains in the footprint of where the buildings had once stood. Inside, the exhibit goes down under the fountains where the original building foundations were. And all along the tour are artifacts from that day, images of the victims and audio recordings uh, from witnesses. You can see things like the structural beams where each plane impacted the buildings. The emergency vehicles crushed when the building collapsed. The seawall that barely held the East River from flooding the subway system. You can hear the stories of those who barely escaped, those who could not, and those who ran into the buildings to save the lives of those who were trapped. Another aspect the 9-11 Memorial Museum highlights very well, I think, is all the victims. You know, it, it's easy sometimes to get lost in the scale of what happened that day. You can go to the memorial and look out at the empty space where those two gigantic buildings used to be. You can stare at the massive list of name after name after name, almost 3,000 people lost their lives that day. A number which, by the way, has actually since been exceeded by those who lost their lives to 9-11 related cancer from all the work they did responding to that scene. And that's a number, by the way, that just keeps rising. So it, it can be easy to kind of get overwhelmed by the sheer scale of the loss. And so one of the things I think the museum does importantly, especially well, is that it has a space carved out with individual tributes to each person lost that day. So you can stop and recognize one person, somebody like Josh Rosenthal, and you can learn a little bit about each person's impact. So when I went through this tour as the new FBI director, I I did something a little bit different, which I was watching my daughter really closely. My daughter's about the same age uh, as most of you. She's in graduate school herself, uh, and she'd been alive in 2001, but she was probably like six. So young enough in one sense to remember it, but not really to understand and really appreciate what had happened. And, and it struck me as we were going through the tour, watching her experience the museum that day, that every time we turned a corner, for example, when we uh, crossed a damaged staircase that had been an evacuation route where people had dodged, you know, falling debris, you could see that she was having kind of an aha moment. I could see her expression change. A couple times I could see a little bit of moisture forming, you know, in the corner of her eye. You know, subtle, but the sort of telltale signs that only a parent uh, can recognize, and I could see her for the first time really experiencing the gravity 
of that day, especially for somebody who, as I said, wasn't totally aware of really what had happened back in 2001. I saw it become so much more real for her. And so I took my experience, watching her experience, back with me to my office at the FBI. Uh, and I thought about it. You know, we have three generations of FBI employees who were live on 9-11. We've got those who, like me, remember what they were doing at the FBI on 9-11. We've got those who were so moved by what happened on 9-11 that they joined the FBI. And then we've got those, like my daughter, that age, who were only kids on 9-11, those for whom they really only know the terrorist attacks as sort of a historical anecdote. Now, that was in 2017. Now, today, in 2022, we have FBI employees who weren't even born on 9-11. And I say all that because I think there's a really important difference between intellectually understanding something and viscerally experiencing it. You know, it's one thing to know about all the ways in which the FBI changed after 9-11, but it's a completely different thing to feel the consequences of our work, what's at stake. Another memory uh, that has stayed with me all these years has to do with an experience I had about two years after 9-11 when I was the Assistant Attorney General. And I took part in a presentation to families of the victims lost in the attacks. And as the day rolled on, I kind of moved to the back of the room, watching the line prosecutors and case agents update the family members sharing what we had learned up to that point about each of the four flights in kind of a detailed minute by minute way. And the grief in that room was palpable. I mean, you could feel the weight of it. It was almost overwhelming. And I remember, for example, the father of one young woman uh, who had died on one of the planes, and he stood up because we had an opportunity for people to ask questions. He stood up to ask a question, but he only got about four or five words into his question before suddenly, abruptly, his knees kind of buckled and he just kind of collapsed to the floor, was lying on the floor kind of, you know, sobbing. And that's, remember, that's two years after the attacks. I remember another man who lost his wife on one of the flights. And as I recall, he was a police officer who was working a night shift. And so he had just gotten home at the time of the attacks and had gone to sleep. And like so many of the victims, his wife, who was a flight attendant on one of the flights, called from the plane as it was going down to say a tearful goodbye. But because he'd gone to sleep, uh, he didn't pick up. So she left a message. But she tried again, you know, maybe a minute or so later. Uh, and this time, you know, he had kind of emerged from his fog, and so he answered the phone. And so they, they got to talk, and they had a chance to say their goodbyes as, you know, gut-wrenching um, and heartbreaking as that must have been. And so her husband then spent the next several days staying with other family, uh, attending to her funeral, making other arrangements. And he returned home several days later, and so he goes into his house to check his new messages. And the first message is that call from his wife, and he hears her voice. And try to imagine what that must have been like, the, the sort of skip in your heart as you hear your spouse's voice thinking you were never going to hear that again only to immediately give way by, to the, you know, the overpowering pain of loss. So that kind of knee-buckling, in the case of the one guy, literally knee-buckling grief that those two men experienced, and remember, there were thousands of them, that sense of having something that's most precious to you taken away, ripped away from you like that, that, that doesn't go away. It dissipates. Uh, with time, but it never, it never goes away. And after you experience, not just in here, but in here, that kind of grief, that, uh, that heaviness, 
after you feel it in your bones, even as a prosecutor or an investigator, much less as a victim or a victim family member, it changes you forever. And the 9-11 attacks profoundly changed not only our country, but they changed the FBI very specifically. Today's FBI reflects those changes in every FBI program, not just counterterrorism. Every investigation, every community we serve, and they continue to impact and share and shape the FBI as we seek to combat new and emerging threats and, and adversaries. So 20 years later, it's vitally important that our agents and analysts not only remember 9-11 as a historical moment, but also understand and feel the urgency of that moment, one that continues to reverberate in how we carry out our day-to-day -day jobs, because those experiences and that urgency uh, should change you. It should give you a deeper understanding of just how much is on the line in this work, how much crime and terrorism wound victims and families, and what an awesome responsibility we have. So as director, I started asking myself, how can I replicate what I and my peers remember about those days and years following 9-11 and what my daughter experienced walking the halls of the 9-11 Memorial Museum, how can I replicate that for our new FBI agents and analysts? And so I had the FBI's training division work with the 9-11 Memorial Museum to set up uh, an on-site class that, that would be a, a small part of every new agent or analyst training. And now every class of new special agent and every new class of intelligence analysts tours the Memorial Museum and takes a class with the staff up there because I believe there is no better way for them to grasp the importance of the work we do, both how we approach that work and the stakes of that work than visiting that hallowed ground in Lower Manhattan. We want new agents and analysts to come away from that visit understanding why we're so focused on integrating intelligence into everything we do, why we emphasize partnerships, why it's so crucial that we tackle every task with rigor and urgency, why we've got to be willing to adapt and innovate to meet constantly emerging new threats. So we have now more than 3,000 trainees have now experienced the memorial, and I'm proud to say that thousands more will have that opportunity in the years to come. And having our agents and analysts make that visit viscerally reinforces for them why they applied to the FBI in the first place. And we hope they come away from that understanding that they didn't pick some ordinary job. They've chosen to do something extraordinary, and millions literally millions of people that they'll never know are counting on them to do that job well, to make sure they do the work right. I have one uh, final thought uh, before we turn to our, our conversation. You know, talking about public service uh, gives me a chance to mention another way that the FBI recreated itself after 9-11, something that led to completely new public service opportunities within the Bureau. Each of the people who lost their lives on 9-11 had their own stories. And the 9-11 Memorial Museum, as I said, does a powerful job of telling them. All of the victims, families, friends, coworkers, suddenly had gaping holes in their lives. And as agencies were overwhelmed in trying to help, the FBI turned to a woman named Catherine Terman, who was a sociologist with the Justice Department, who had worked as a victim witness advocate. And Catherine grew and built the FBI's Victim Services Division from a handful of well-intentioned staff into a world-renowned core of more than 300 specially trained professionals. We even have two crisis response canines, Wally and Geo. Uh, and uh, other than the fact that they leave a lot of hair all over my suit, uh, I can attest that they are both wonderful at what they do. And we now have victim specialists in each of our 56 field offices all over the country to help people harmed by crime. They provide on-scene assistance. They triage needs. They refer victims to counseling, employment, housing, 
immigration, medical, or legal services. They go with FBI special agents for things like interviews or death notifications, and they coordinate as liaisons with other government agencies and external partners. And the work they do with children is particularly outstanding. And regardless of what else is going on in our world, these are FBI professionals who are ready to drop everything to help in their communities or to quickly fly elsewhere to set up shop. You know, their work doesn't always get as much attention uh, as our FBI special agents, but for instance, just uh, two weeks ago, at the same time that our agents were arriving in Colorado Springs to investigate the absolutely tragic and intolerable shooting at Club Q, our victim specialists were there too, establishing a family assistance center to provide services and assistance for those affected and the families of those killed. It is heartbreaking, really, to see events like that play out over and over again as they have this year. But I'm proud of the work that everyone involved in that case in Colorado and all of these kinds of cases has been doing. They truly make a positive difference in people's lives. So I guess if I had to choose one thing to ask you to take away from today, it's that public service doesn't have to be aimed at affecting dozens or even millions of people to be meaningful. When I think about that mom and her son in Atlanta in the 90s, I recognize how all of us involved in investigating and prosecuting that case changed her life and her son's life for the better. And again, while that trial generated a certain amount of news coverage, I'm not sure anybody outside of that courtroom really grasped what had happened. But it definitely meant something to her, and it continues to mean something to me today. Even thinking about 9-11, as the guy overseeing the case against Zacharias Massawi, who was sometimes called the 20th hijacker, I remember how important it was to our whole team there to make a point of treating, treating each and every one of the 2,977 victims that day as individuals, individuals who had been murdered and whose families shouldn't be cheated of the grief and loss they were all feeling just because of the sheer number of people killed on that day. So commitment to the pursuit of justice for every American, that for as long as it takes. And that's the kind of work that the FBI's 38,000 men and women are doing really every day in communities all over this country and overseas, all over the world. So if helping others interests you, I hope you'll consider a career at the FBI, but more than that, I hope you'll consider public service in whatever avenue you find and in whatever capacity your life allows. I, I think I'm proof that a career can navigate both private practice and public service, and I will tell you, having done both during those times of my life when I've been able to devote myself to public service, uh, I've been fortunate, blessed really, to feel the immense fulfillment that comes from the opportunity to serve others and my own community. And I can promise you that you too will find immeasurable value in serving others. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to our conversation.